Our second speaker is Julie K. Allen, who grew up in Laie, Hawaii, and attended both BYU Hawaii and BYU Profo. Served a mission in Denmark and got her MA and PhD in Germanic languages and literatures from Harvard University. After teaching Scandinavian studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison from 2006 to 2016, she came to BYU in Provo, where she is a professor of comparative literature in Scandinavian studies. Julie is the mother of four children and the author of, of four books and several dozen articles on topics ranging from Danish immigration to LDS uh, global studies. With the help of a, a team of student researchers, she is currently working on creating a database of Scandinavian Mormon women pioneers. She loves to travel, read, bake, hike, swim, and get stuff done. Without further ado, let's give a warm welcome to Julie Allen. Thank you so much. It's a really a pleasure to be here. One of my favorite topics about one of my favorite countries. I also feel very strongly that my call to Denmark was uh, inspired by God um, to help me also learn about my own Danish ancestry. I had one Danish great-great-grandmother who came over um, with her brother. He went to Paris, Idaho. She went to, um, to work in a sort of a farm where she met Samuel Knight, the son of Newell K. Knight, and they went down to Santa Clara. And she lived the next what, 10 years in a wagon box in Mountain Meadows mostly, um, and then died at 39, um, leaving no record, as far as I know, of her experiences. So I have always thought of her when I think about these questions of conversion and religious freedom for people in Denmark. And in her case, it was a terrifying choice that she made that may have made her life shorter than it would have been otherwise. I don't know if she would have died so young if she'd stayed home. Um, and so in thinking about Michelle's terrific paper, I want us to not only think about this long, difficult path that 19th century Danish converts to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints had to obtain legal protections for their religious liberty, um, and also the gap to actually enjoying those protections, but I also want to think about those who stayed, those who didn't make that same choice, um, because that's also part of liberty. Um, and the majority of the converts to the church you know, there are roughly 23,000 Danes that converted between 1850 and 1920. About 17,000 of them choose to emigrate to Utah, to immigrate here to Utah. Um, and they had different choices. They didn't necessarily have better lives. They had different lives because of what they chose. And they've left a remarkable legacy here of hundreds of thousands of Latter-day Saints who have that uh, Danish and Scandinavian ancestry, which is one reason for the, the project on creating a database of these women to understand how their experiences played out in this new place with these new opportunities. But in my time today, I'd like to remain in 19th century Denmark for a moment and consider how the matter of religious liberty looked from the other side, from the perspective of Danes who chose not to join the church for whatever reason, or to leave the church, or to join the church but not emigrate, and people who had to come to terms with the fact that so many of their friends, family members, and neighbors did make that choice. The gift of, of religious liberty enhanced individual agency, but precisely that same liberty and agency often leads people we love to make choices we disagree with. So in the few minutes I have today, I want to explore the good faith reactions of two 19th century Danes. First, briefly, that of the Reverend Peter Christian Kierkegaard, brother of the philosopher Søren Kierkegaard, and then in somewhat more detail, that of Baroness Elisa Stampe, and look at their reactions to their neighbor's exercise of religious freedom, which underscores the gap between legal guarantees of such freedom and the social and existential repercussions of its use. As we um, saw, you know, these are familiar faces, maybe both the Constitution and Monrad, a little bit younger Monrad, um, his you know, more revolutionary days. Um, this is uh, the, the establishment, as we've just heard from Michelle, the establishment of religious freedom in the Danish constitution of 1849, which was drafted almost single-handedly by this idealistic young priest, Dietlio Gotthard Monral, who later had a, a checkered political career in Denmark, um, represented a significant break with the long-standing privileging of the evangelical Lutheran church under Danish law. 
For centuries, membership of the Danish Lutheran Church had been a prerequisite for full citizenship and full membership in Danish society, which made things particularly difficult for Catholics and Jews in, the, um, in Denmark. There were many who were foreign, but many who lived there also for centuries. In the early 19th century, due to the spread of lay religious re revival movements and the emergence of new religious denominations like the Baptists, the need to expand the religious tent in Denmark became pressing. The constitutional protection of religious freedom, as we've heard, grew out of the Danish state's struggle to accommodate the demands of Danish Baptists in the 1840s for the right to practice their religion, but it also opened the door to the proselytizing of missionary representatives of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, who began arriving in Denmark within a year of the Constitution's ratification. As I document in my book, Danish But Not Lutheran, from 2017, the resulting wave of Danish converts and later convert emigrants disrupted Danish communities and destabilized the longstanding equivalence of Danishness and Lutheranism. This resulted in some public riots, destruction of property, and threats to the safety of both converts and missionaries, as Michelle described, as well as frequent polemical treatises against the new religion that were published in Danish newspapers. Many of those Danes who joined the church eventually sacrificed their homes, their relationships, and their jobs to practice their religious freedom, despite the legality of their conversion. At the heart of the religious disputes that erupted across Denmark in the 1850s was the slippage between the legal right to religious liberty as established by the Constitution and an individual's right, exercise of that right. Many people who approved of religious freedom in theory, including the influential Danish religious reformer, Bishop Nikolai Frederik Severin Grundtvig, NFS Grundtvig, um, on the left, and his protege, the Reverend, later Bishop Peter Christian Kierkegaard, were frustrated by the real life repercussions of the exercise of religious freedom in their parishes, in their villages, in their neighborhoods, and their families, especially after the commencement of LDS proselytizing. It was one thing to grant it in the Constitution, another thing entirely to have thousands of your parishioners and neighbors changing their religion and thus changing their identity as we heard in the previous panel in this room, that religious identity has been a factor really for a long time. Both of these men were early advocates of religious freedom in Denmark, along with Monral. They advocated particularly for the parishioners' freedom to choose their own congregations, rather than being required to attend geographically determined ones, and for the establishment of independent congregations outside the Danish state church. In the 1840s, Gontvi was one of those priests who opposed the forcible baptism of B Baptist children, which was a PR debacle for the Danish state church, um, and it contributed directly to the inclusion of religious freedom in the 1849 constitution. Gontvi also backed up Peter Christian Kierkegaard in the latter's refusal to carry out such baptisms in his own parish, a refusal that required him to answer to the Danish king himself for why he refused to uphold the law. So it was one thing to countenance the existence of Baptist congregations and to defy authority to protect that right for the Baptists, which wasn't even a right yet, and yet another to lose one's own parishioners en masse to a foreign faith that denounced your own as sinful and inadequate. And it's really quite striking. If you read the missionaries were saying in the 1850s, they were basically saying, you're all fools and you're going to go to hell. I mean, I, that's pretty much a quote, right? So, so it was not that this was a friendly, hey, we've got lots to offer. It wasn't a Gordon B. Hinckley kind of practicing. It was much more of a like, you know, I mean, one of the people I read my, my book, he comes to Utah leaving his family behind because he is so convinced the second coming is imminent and you have to be here or you will be left behind. And so he writes these heartbreaking letters to his wife for seven years about how he'd really like her to come and be saved because Christ is coming. Um, and so it's a, it's a sense of, of imminent threat that people are feeling on both sides of this um, experience. So a lot of the violent disturbances of LDS meetings and the harassment of LDS missionaries was generally the work of frustrated Danish laymen. Reverend Kierkegaard took a more intellectual route after he encountered LDS missionaries preaching in his parish and converting his parishioners. At the missionary's invitation, he spoke at a cottage me meeting to refute their doctrines and persuade his parishioners to remain within the Danish church. He then used those remarks as the basis for a series of public lectures titled About and Against Mormonism that he published in the summer of 1855 under the same title. While it would be easy to vilify Reverend Kierkegaard's opposition to the teaching of LDS missionaries as bigoted and misguided, there can be little doubt about the sincerity of his own beliefs. As his tract makes clear, he concludes his discussion of LDS theology as presented by the local missionaries with the following impassioned plea for his listeners to take the matter of their own spiritual salvation seriously. 
He says, I have raised arguments that testify to the authenticity of our Christianity, and I have seriously discussed and refuted that which has been apparently stated against it here. While I've had fun with some of the nonsense that could be found amidst the objections that it was too unfounded to be treated seriously, he particularly has problems with the idea that the stick of Joseph and the stick of Judah are transmuted into golden plates. Um, and he also doesn't like the alliteration of Mohammedans, um, Mennonites, Mormons. He finds the M religions really sort of <laughs> problematic. Um, so, but both the seriousness and the jest will only be of real and lasting benefit to us if we, in rejecting this new heresy that revives and redoubles old delusions by pointing out some of the good arguments, good old arguments that testify of the one original faith and baptism that are preserved even today in the Lord's Church, have felt ourselves challenged and strengthened in the desire to appropriate that faith and that baptism and thereby to actively merge with the true church of the Lord, regardless of how much of its teachings seem either fanciful and strange, even unreasonable to our natural intellect, or are completely opposed to our natural will with all that follows it. If we do so, we will come further and further toward and into the one perfect and eternally decisive proof of the truth of our faith and the validity of our baptism, which cannot be proven or judged by human intellect and reason, but which the faithful have in themselves and for themselves, and which can precisely therefore not be touched, let alone shaken, by any victory that other more refined and better dressed heretics might possibly ever win over us or others of those who preach the original unchanged Christianity in all its simplicity. And I think if you didn't know who said this, you might think it was a conference talk, right? It's a really clear testimony of his belief that, that his church offered salvation to his parishioners. It's not slander, it's not hateful, it's really just his choice to practice this religious uh, style, flavor. Um, anyway, this ardent defense of Lutheran theology and baptism reflects Kierkegaard's own testimony and his belief that his parishioners should exercise their religious liberty by choosing to stay in the church they already knew, but maybe needed to recommit themselves to. Peter Christian Kierkegaard devoted his life to his ministering, doing his best to bring the people with whose welfare he had been entrusted to Christ in the way he understood best. While the eruption of LDS missionaries and the resulting exodus of converts from his parish may have irritated and frustrated Reverend Kierkegaard, the need to defend his faith seems also to have strengthened his resolve to stand firm in the face of opposition. Reverend Kierkegaard was a public figure with a financial and administrative interest in maintaining the stability of his parish, but the second person I want to discuss today had no such vested interest in the establishment. The violence and polemics of most Danish opponents of religious freedom apparently did not resonate with Baroness Elisa Stampe, a Danish noblewoman who had been confirmed by Grundtvig and who maintained a close friendship and correspondence with him for decades. When a friend of hers chose to join the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in the mid-1850s, Stampe chose to try to understand her friend's decision by exploring LDS theology in depth and up close from a scholarly, open-minded perspective, even though she knew that taking this upstart American religion seriously would incur the ridicule of her peers and the disapproval of her mentor, Gontvi. Stampe recorded her research and her conclusions in a remarkable book titled simply Mormonism, that she wrote in around 1859, but which has languished unpublished, unread, and untranslated at the Danish Royal Library since her death. In the rest of this talk, I will present and analyze a few excerpts from Stampe's remarkable book in order to show how Stampe navigates the tensions between legal rights and individual choices in the matter of religious liberty in 1850s Denmark. The daughter of Baron Henrik Stampe and his wife Christina Dalgas, Christine Marie Elisabeth Stampe, known as Elise, was raised in the most cultivated and privileged circles in Danish society in the final decades of the Danish Golden Age. In 1842, at the age of 18, Stampe traveled with her parents and the sculptor Bertel Thorvaldsen, who you might know from the Christus, um, to Rome, where she interacted with a vibrant group of Danish artists working there. Her interest in art and theater there was gradually replaced by an inclination towards spirituality, however, especially after a serious illness nearly took her life while in Rome. So in 1843, at age 19, she became a stiftsdame, a kind of lay nun at the convent at Valeu, a Lutheran convent for Danish noblewomen founded by Queen Sophie Magdalena in 1737. In this era, it was not unusual for wealthy, wealthy Danish families to purchase a lifetime place in the order for their daughters, which cost about 4,000 crowns in 1800, as insurance against the possibility that they might not marry. Although Stampe never entered the convent as a nun, this affiliation afforded her certain rights, an annual stipend, and a social rank, all of which would have been invalidated if she married, which she never did. So she, religion was a big part of her life, 
also from her heritage. Her maternal grandfather, Jean-Marc d'Agas, was a descendant of French Huguenots who'd sought refuge from persecution during the reign of the French King Louis XIV in the late 17th century, and they'd come to Denmark for that, for that protection. He died more than a dozen years before Stampa's birth in 1824, but his calling as a pastor in a French Reformed church in Falecha, a free city for religious um, belief, remained a source of family pride. Stampa grew up together with Gonfi's children, went to confirmation with Gonfi, and spent a lot of her youth asking questions about religion. She frequently asked Gonfi those questions in her letters. She wrote with him for decades, and particularly between 1856 and 1861, when she was investigating her friend's conversion to Mormonism, she asked him a lot of questions about what he believed, why he believed them, trying to understand her own faith. She also corresponded with Reverend Kierkegaard and got his opinion about her writings. Prior to writing Mormonism in the late 1850s, Stampa had written and published a volume of religious poetry titled Alvo, Seriousness, that was sold as a fundraiser for Danish Lutheran missionary work, and two collections of sermons and religious reflections, all of which appeared anonymously. This was not a time in Denmark when women could publish under their own names, and so she published most of her books under the title, uh, the author of, by the author of the, the previous book. Um, so she went on to publish more than a dozen other works um, attributed to the author of Alvo, or the author of any of these other collections, and they dealt with all kinds of topics, primarily patriotic and theological questions, and they ranged from two to three page pamphlets to 766 page treatises. They sold for around 12 shillings for the short ones, which is roughly the same what it would have cost for a pound of green soap, to one riz de and 24 shillings for the longer works, which was equivalent to twice a daily laborer's, a laborer's daily wage, which was between 56 and 65 shillings, um, depending on the season. So these were not just books you could pick up on the side of the road for the average peasant to read. They were available to Danes in the educated classes. But the topics she explores in her texts are of interest to all Danes and to all people, really, and show that she was eager to use the medium of the written word to work through the existential challenges that religious liberty presented. Mormonism is the most pro provocative of Stampa's works, in my opinion, which might explain why she never published it. It clocks in at about 400 manuscript pages, handwritten on blue paper, bound into booklets. So you can see the, the cover in the first page here, and you are welcome to help me read it if you would like to. Um, I'm working on a transcription and a translation, but it's, it's kind of slow going. Um, also because she kept scribbling things out and like pasting in little scraps of paper over other bits of it. Um, but it is, goes into staggering depth about LDS theology um, in relationship to the expectations of Danish Lutheranism and tackling the disdain of in Danish intellectuals head on in a way that I find unparalleled in anything else I have studied. In her foreword, Stampa acknowledges the widespread prejudice against Mormonism in elite Danish society, but expresses her determination to approach the subject objectively. She says, it is asking a great deal of the reader to digest an entire book about Mormonism. What would she say if she saw a Deseret book? Who knew? Um, and what will he say to see Mormonism presented as, an, as a great spiritual curiosity, even as something extraordinary? Mormonism, which only attacks, attracts ignorant, uneducated wretches with no prospects, which is rarely even mentioned in the civilized world, and even those who most fervently oppose false sects and doctrines cannot be bothered to waste more than a, a, most a little tossed off pamphlet on. Mormonism. It is said of it that it defeats itself, but even this self-defeat is not worth attending to. Mormonism, which everyone has the right to laugh at and say, God save us about, without knowing anything about it. Mormonism, which would make a despised social outcast of any person who dared to talk about it with the same interest that one talks of Platonism, Islam, or any religion that might be of interest to learn about. One will find this Mormonism presented here. I, mean, I just love this. She's like quoting all the things they say and saying, bring it on. <laughs> um, uh, not just as a highly interesting and enlightening phenomenon, but also not, as not exactly a theology, but rather a combination of doctrines that poses quite serious questions for which we need to find answers, whether it be in Mormonism itself or somewhere else. In stark contrast to Reverend Kierkegaard's rather superior disdain, Stampe is more open-minded, describing Mormonism as a great spiritual curiosity, even something extraordinary. Her approach challenges the notion that one can dismiss Mormonism out of hand, despite the tremendous impact it had had on so many of her countrymen, and criticizes her supposedly intellectually curious peers for their unwillingness to even discuss the topic. As mentioned previously, her interest in Mormonism grew out of a friendship with a woman who converted to the church during the first decade of the missionary's presence. By studying Mormonism, she hoped to be able to persuade her friend of the error of her ways. 
In a letter to Grundtvig on September 14, 1857, Stampe explains, I am so happy and peaceful after having had a good talk with her, and I am certain that it will prove itself one day not to have been in vain when the hour of the Lord arrives. After her friend died rather suddenly in the fall of 1858, which Grundtvig said was probably a blessing, Stampe completed her book in 1859 as a resource for those trying to understand how their friends, families, and neighbors could use their religious liberty to choose a faith so different from their familiar Lutheranism. She explains, it is with regard to those souls, both among the Mormons and the non-Mormons, who have some truth within them that this entire book is written. And she explains elsewhere that having some truth within them is the most one can say of any human being. In keeping with this empathetic approach, Stampa uses her book to try to understand why someone might use their religious liberty to choose Mormonism. Stressing that truth will resonate with seekers of it, she describes what is deceptively attractive about Mormonism, what gives it the appearance of truth in the eyes of many truth seekers, and precisely how it is exactly the deceiver's greatest art to misuse individual truths in his service, without which the deceiver could never appear to us as an angel of light. Chief among the strings of truth upon which Mormonism plays that Stampa identifies is the belief in ongoing revelation, which she discusses at length. The exercise of religious freedom relies heavily on the belief that people can determine what is true for themselves and choose it. Although Stampa may disagree with the conclusions other people reach in their quest for personal revelation, she endorses the principle itself. After quoting Parley P. Pratt and Orson Pratt at great length, Stampa reports that the missionaries and converts she has spoken to insist about the centrality of revelation to all scripture. They say to her, can a dead book guide the world? Can anything dead guide living people? But if you say that the scriptures are not dead, why do you call the inspiration of the spirit deception? Why do you then not believe in prophets? For when you say that the scriptures are not dead but alive, then you must also admit that it must still be the spirit, even in this moment, that makes them live. For if the spirit inhabited the scriptures a thousand years ago but is not present now, then the scriptures could not continue to live from the fact that the spirit had once inhabited them. When you say that the scriptures live now and that thus the spirit inhabits them still, then you must also accept new inspiration and revelation. For such an animation of the scriptures now is precisely such a new inspiration, a new revelation of the same old eternal truth. In fact, because of her admiration for the Mormon's dedication to the principle of ongoing revelation, Stampa describes the Doctrine and Covenants, recently translated, as a more appropriate companion to the New Testament than the Book of Mormon, based on the former text's mutual focus on the deeds of Christ's apostles. Within this new book of apostolic revelations, Stampa finds and quotes at length familiar truths and beautiful passages that she quotes for her readers, among them Doctrine and Covenants 1, 24 to 28, 43, 23 to 26, 50, 31 to 34, 88, 3, and 99, 21 to 24. So she clearly had read everything. She'd read Parley P. Pratt, Orson Pratt. She'd talked to missionaries. She'd talked to converts. And you might think, well, of course, she'll join the church. How could she not? She's felt the spirit. She knows it's true. And many of the stories we tell of people like Stampa do end with this, but hers doesn't. She never joined the LDS Church, and she wrote her book in order to persuade other people not to either. But in the process of writing her book, Stampa experienced personal revelation and spiritual gifts of the kind she was learning about. She explains in the foreword to the book, only very few books and resources were available to me during this task, but God has assisted me with it, and I believe he has compensated for its lacks and given me the Spirit's insight into the matter in general, however much I may have made mistakes in individual details, which allowed me to know more about the matter than much more external knowledge and instruction could have taught me, taught many others. I believe that the enlightenment of the Spirit has been close at hand while I've been writing, and that almost always when I needed it most. And again, this resonates because that's how I feel when the Lord is helping me write things. That it's that same sense that the Spirit is guiding me. And in attempting to humbly and sincerely understand the reasons informing her friend's exercise of religious freedom, Stampa found her own faith strengthened, which gave her the compassion she sought. As she declares, I do not know how it came about that there is some truth and goodness in Mormonism, but I expect it does not simply come from Satan taking the form of an angel of light, but also from what I said previously about not just the spirit of the devil, but also the spirit of mankind having introduced Mormonism. Be that as it may, the cause of truth will always, as has been said, emerge victorious, as long as one never tries to close one's eyes to any form of truth, no matter where it appears. This willingness to seek the truth and acknowledge it wherever it appears is central to the exercise of religious freedom, both for those who choose a new path, like the 17,000 Danish convert immigrants who left Danish Lutheran Church and made their way here to Utah, and for those who chose and continue to choose deliberately, prayerfully, to stay in the religious communities to which they already belong. 
While hard-won legal protections are helpful in maintaining re new religious denominations and mainstreaming them into society, true religious liberty lies, relies on the individuals accepting their own and others' rights and responsibility to seek truth through personal revelation, wrestling with the angels we encounter on our way, and acknowledging God's hands in all things bright and beautiful in the world around us. Thank you. So we have about a dozen minutes for questions. My colleague, uh, Robert Freeman, is going to have a microphone that he'll be passing around. And we'll ask both Michelle and Julie to respond to uh, the questions here uh, at the stand so you can hear them. So if you'll state your name and uh, you know clearly into the microphone what your question is and ask and just mention which of these speakers you're uh, you have the question for. Okay? Great. I think either one of you could deal with this question. I, I'm curious, the Latter-day Saints look to Denmark with fondness, thinking this is a big part of our story and celebrate the kinds, well, some of the stories that you talked about. I, I'm wondering if Baptists do. Baptists is not, the, there's a lot of, there's Baptist split, <laughs> but is there a sense in which Denmark feels like sacred space in the stories of Baptists beyond Denmark? Um, so on my mission, I met a lot of Danish Baptists, and they felt clearly that God had brought the Baptist faith to Denmark. Um, but of course, it came through Germany. And so it was German Baptists who converted the Danes who brought them in there. And I think those German Baptists were converted by American Baptists. Um, and so there's definitely a sense that among the Baptists I know in Denmark that they're part of a larger community, but not that Denmark is particularly significant in that. I mean, they, they felt that God inspired the Baptists to come to Denmark, but it wasn't an instrumental part of that. I'm interested in the dynamics of the families in Denmark as they noted that some of their children or some of their cousins left and some did not. And did those who stay, some of them say, you know, I love the gospel, but I can't, you know, I need to stay with my, do we have any information that kind of shows the struggle that some of them were, and that uh, they didn't want to, didn't want to, you know, violate their family members by joining this new church or by leaving? Any comments about that? I can just add to that. There's, there's quite a lot of people who do join and leave, and so you have a lot of families where one spouse comes to Utah and the other stay behind. And so, um, in those cases, they clearly prioritize the, the new faith over their families. But there are other ones where they, they they chose to stay. So it's not like you can really generalize about the whole 23,000 of them. If you look at the 19th century and the work of CCA Christensen, he does a lot of narrative work in his art and focused a lot, uh, at least to some extent, on Scandinavian roots. And one of the things he was responding to was what was happening in the Royal Academy in Denmark, that they were concerned about uh, being engulfed by the Germans. And so in saying, OK, let's be real Danish here. And so that meant Danish farms, Danish peasants, because Danish peasants and Danish farms look different than German farms. Now the question is, that I have is, when you look at the conflict of religion um, among the population of Denmark, even after the, um, the constitutional change, did Germans or fear of German encroachment play any role here? Were, were the Germans on, in southern Denmark, were they Lutherans or Catholics? Uh, is, there, is there some sort of any dynamic there that would have caused consternation among the Danish populations in, say, 1850? Yeah, so it's an excellent question. I mean, Danish nationalism is a huge part of Danish identity in the 19th century, particularly after they lose Slesvig and Holstein to the Germans in 1864. Um, they're Lutherans throughout. In fact, 
the Constitution, I don't think, even allows Catholics yet. I mean, like, they still, Jesuits are still completely forbidden to come into the country at all. Um, and there's a, a long standing fear of, of Catholics um, that persists after the Constitution. Norway, even longer, I think it's um, into the 20th century. They also don't acknowledge our church until the 1950s. So, you know, they were a little behind. But, um, but I don't know that it actually in, informed their religious. Um, practices the same way. Pietism had been a really strong part of the lay religious revivals in the early 19th century coming from Germany. Um, and so you had a lot of German queens in Denmark and they brought their relatives. Um, Nicholas Zinzendorf is a cousin of the queen um, in the 1700s who brings the pietism to Denmark and that spreads and really feeds the revival movement that prepares the way for the religious reforms that Grundtvig and Kierkegaard um, talk about and that mon rather than inscribes into the Constitution. And so also with the Baptists bringing, um, coming in through Germany, I, I don't get the sense from, from my work that it was really nationalistic in that way, that religion seemed to be a little bit outside of those, those parameters. Our time is up. Thank you for your being a great audience, your excellent questions. And I would like to again thank Michelle and Julie for exceptional papers. I think they did a great job. And, if we were in Denmark, we'd say Tusen Tak, a thousand thanks. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Julie, great job. And we have a little time in between, so maybe you may want to visit with them one-on-one -on -one if you didn't get your questions answered. Thank you.